weekly read is our happy place to share, learn, discuss, and explore. Weekly read occurs every Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific time. I'm your host, Yash Aswini Vishwanath, and you can call me Yash. I'm logging from Bangalore, India, and I would like to know where you're all coming from. Please type away your name and location in the chat. We would like to get to know you better. I'm a an AI researcher who focuses on responsible AI. I'm also pursuing my master's in artificial intelligence here in Bangalore. At Weekly Wed, we empower and enable the students to dive deeper into artificial intelligence, autonomous vehicles, and for those who want to break into these, into AI and AV, we provide a lot of information that will take off their journey. Generally, we host speakers from varied backgrounds working on autonomous vehicles and artificial intelligence. Today, and uh, I'll be, we will be recording this. So please go off camera if you do not want to be recorded. And this is also live streamed on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. So today, I want to welcome Marlena Lau, who is the staff speaker who is joining us today. Marlena is an experienced software implementation and project management consultant with a strong ability to identify and solve ambiguous problems as well as to manage multiple competing priorities simultaneously. Marlena Lau works as a software project manager in the autonomous vehicle space at Danfoss. And she was previously working at the Boom Lab as a technical project management consultant. Marlena Lau is the founder and president of Minnesota Artificial Intelligence Network. Marlena, we are so honored to have an AV expert, an autonomous vehicle expert like you, joining us to give us key learnings about autonomous vehicles. And uh, I uh, uh, give a warm welcome on behalf of everybody, on behalf of everybody here at Weekly Wed. Welcome, Marlena, and the floor is yours. Absolutely, thank you. I had to like go back to my bio too and go back and read it like, oh, that's that, that's me. <laughs> well, thank you, Yaz. Thank you, Sudha, um, for allowing me to come today and to speak about my perspective and experiences in project management and an exciting field of autonomy vehicles. And I have to say that this is amazing to be in a space with women. Um, who are leading and taking the charge. Um, often it's usually the complete opposite. We're usually that 1% person um, in technology. So I'm so, ex so excited to see women really leading in this space and learning about it and to have the opportunity to share my career path, my journey, and what I find exciting about Tony. So I'll go right into it. I know we have a jam pack hour session today. And I hope I do my people, my friends at Danvaz justice when I do this presentation. Uh, Thank you, Marlena. And I hope you can share the screen now. Let me know if you find it difficult. Um, absolutely. Um, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, we are all set. Perfect. Perfect. So um, today's session is me talking about leading change through autonomy. My name is Marlena Love, as Yaz said. I am a software project manager in the field of autonomy vehicles at Danvaz. And I will get a chance to take a deeper dive into that later um, about autonomy vehicle and Danvaz and what I do with my team. Um, for today's agenda, I would do my own personal one-on-one -on -one of autonomy, of what I've learned in the industry, the state of autonomy as it is now, um, looking at autonomy and the future, like getting an outlook of what we can expect within the next few years. Um, we'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence, as well as career pathways, how to pivot your career into autonomy, and even to tech if you're a non-technical person, and as well as sharing my learnings, my journey, 
and how I got here today. But first, I have to give you a disclaimer. All content presented today are my own and do not reflect the opinions of my current past or future employers. Just have to put that out there. Even though we're gonna, these are all based on my personal brain here. So what do we um, what do we say? What is autonomy? Uh, we understand by definition is self governance a vehicle's ability to act on its own without human interference. Very straight out the dictionary. But when we look at autonomy, we look at it at how far can we go where a vehicle can drive itself without me in it, and how can it do the functionalities uh, without my interference. And that's what I do with autonomy vehicles. You've probably heard of Tesla, of taxi, even with Amazon drones, and even now with Uber with their uh, robo taxis. My particular industry is off highway vehicles. So in industries such as mining, construction, agriculture are all um, vehicles that I help support from a software development standpoint. So looking into that, there are different levels of autonomy. We start out at ground zero, which is no autonomy, autonomy meaning that the person, the driver is in full control, they make all the decisions. So when we look at levels, there are five from zero. One meaning that there's few functions are automated, but the driver still remains in control and make the decision. When we're ready to go into level two, that's partial automation. Um, the driver still remains alert, engaged and in control, but now the vehicle can perform on its own with just a few, few more functionalities and some complex functions at that. Level three, where my employer and where a lot of companies are today, are where we have a conditional automation, where the vehicle can monitor the environment and can perform driving tests. And only at the few critical points where a driver has to pay attention to detail is required. In an ideal state where we're driving for is full autonomy. You have two levels here where it's high autonomy, where the vehicle performs all or most tasks with little intervention, or let's say at this point, we don't need a driver, the car driving on its own, and that's ideal state. Well, Lena, we saw the five levels of autonomy, and uh, can we go over the levels of autonomy again from level one and look at examples that we see in and around us, which have these capabilities of autonomy? Yeah, absolutely, that's a good, um, that's a good point. So let's look at examples. So we say a level one, a few functions that are automated, but the driver remains in control. We can say um, with a cars. So like with my car, I drive a Nissan. Um, I drive it, I have all control over it. I press my buttons, I start it. But an example would be cruise control that I have the option to put my car into to, cru to cruise control where it's driving on its own, but it's not making any decisions um, at that point. When you look at off highway, is where we have the tractor on, on the pilot mode and there, that's all it's doing. So think of it as cruise control at that point. Now, when we look at level two, where it's guided, think of cars today where you can do automatic, um, automatic, what's the good word I'm looking for is parallel parking. Some cars, if some people have the trust, <laughs> can have their car to do like parallel parking on its own. But in most cases, you'll have cars where you'll, um, I forgot a car extension you have it, but you have a car that do parallel parking. But at some points, like if I'm close to a car or I'm about to hit an edge, the driver might, um, have control of their steering wheel just to make sure that they are parking um, in that spot. Now, taking that same example into a level three is where, hey, do parallel parking, probably a few points I might look out, a few um, warning signs might come up, but the car can do parallel parking by itself in that area. Now, four and five, 
is where we say that the car can drive on its own. Now you have this like in Tesla where a car is driving. Um, a critical point, especially a concerning point for some people is when did the car stop on its own? Where you do want to pay attention. So let's say that a car is driving on the expressway or let's say even since I'm in uh, off highway vehicles that we're doing crops and agriculture and we have the um, tractor is going through the rows, sorting out your vegetables, your crops or so, but something might come up. Um, do that vehicle recognize that there's an obstacle in front of it or do it run over it? Obstacle can be something of a crop that's not supposed to be there. It can even be a human being, but does that vehicle recognize and does it know when to stop? In some cases, a driver will still be in a car and they'll say, hey, you might want to stop. Matter of fact, I'm going to press stop right now. That that is a human being. We do not want to run over it. Now, if you have really good algorithms, you have good sensor management, and your tractor is really good in, in identifying objects, edge, or when it's about to run into a wall, it will be able to recognize that through its sensors and stop immediately. So a lot of this happens around safety and recognizes its limits. What do it see in its path when it's moving? And where do it need the driver to make decisions, say, hey, stop, make a left turn or right turn, or be cautious? Marlena, we have a question here from Emmanuel. Uh, before I move to the question, I have a question. Yeah, sure. uh, we studied about KiwiBot in, in the no-code AI class. Um, so KiwiBot is a food delivery bot which uh, goes over in universities and in San Jose. Uh, so KiwiBot is a level five bot, I suppose. So I just wanted to know if that is the case. Um, KiwiBot uh, is able to drive on its own and when obstacles come, it's able to stop and navigate across. So uh, Sudha or Susanna would like to add anything about KiwiBot here? Okay, Susanna is telling KiwiBot is level three. Okay. Uh, so, okay, thank you for that. And uh, now I will uh, ask the Emmanuel's question. What is the value proposition for autonomous off-road vehicles? More accuracy, machine running 24 or bar seven, less human pretty? He says, what is a value proposition? Mm -hmm. It really depends on your customers, right? I know for us, the value proposition, the customers we tend to target, um, they have like labor shortages or um, they don't really have, um, they have a safety concern. So when we're dealing with off-highway vehicles, uh, especially in mining, which is considered dangerous for, dangerous for humans being, it's more of, are you safe? Can you have a machine do the things that are more dangerous for human beings in an area? Um, when it comes to machine learning, those are naturally automation. It's more of, well, actually, for the context of agriculture, um, which is important. When you have um, seasons, do you have different crops that go in the season and you're short on, lab on labor? You have to be able to collect crops, get data, package it, and ship it in a set amount of time. And if you're doing that manually or just with a few machines, you're not able to meet that um, demand in an area. So I would say like to be more efficient um, in that area and also to be more sustainable when you have an attractor um, that is based on electricity, you're not really using gas as much. So it's saving your environment in that way. And it's also helping with their labor costs um, that save the company money there. Madalena, uh, Sudha has a question. What are off highway vehicles, OHV category, to which levels of autonomy does it come under? It comes in all levels, and it depends on the resources and technology that company has. Um, most companies that we support with our functionality are level three, where there are some level assistance. 
and it depends on the industry um, in that area as well. So with us, we support um, the level three where driver assistance and you have controllers um, available to collect data um, and to really see how things are working in the area. Uh, Marlena, uh, the, we saw the different levels of autonomy and we saw various examples of levels of autonomy. Uh, and I would just like to read out uh, Sudha's comment here about KiwiPort. KiwiPort cannot drive autonomously without a driver in all terrains. Mm -hmm. It is trained in a set of roads and safely drives in those roads only. It is monitored remotely by a human who will take over control if anything goes wrong. That was the reason why we say that KiwiBot is level three. And uh, we're all ears to know more about levels of autonomy and autonomous vehicles from you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing to note uh, when it comes to autonomous, um, autonomy and artificial intelligence is that it is fed data, right? Um, it's, it only knows as much data as you put into it, and it's important. Um, do you have access to all that data to be able to recognize obstacles when you see it? And when you think about off-highway vehicles, like in our industry, um, the data that we train, it can be on a nice sunny day, but what happens if it's raining, if it's snowing, um, if the environment um, is unforeseen and the, the, um, the machine is not trained around that area? So you have to have that guidance there because data, there's only so much data available and so much data you have to clean through. So when we talk about a full high autonomy, that's saying that you have accounted for everything um, when it comes to what your machine is trained on and what it's looking out for. So the safe route is to have that autonomy, but still be able to monitor and control on where it's going I probably personally would recommend to have a full autonomy to say, yeah, the machine can make all the decisions. You still have to be able to um, make sure that it's guided and it's following those um, protocols, which is essential to having like KPIs and metrics to make sure it's hitting those target. Thank you, Marlena. And we would like to know more from your slides about autonomous vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's another layer to this. So you have your levels when you understand um, what level of autonomy you want. And it's all subjective to what your problem you're trying to solve for, like what's your goal here um, and what that customer want. Every um, customer is different. And so we talk about the layers. Um, there's, I believe, like six or five, but for today's context, I'll talk about three. It's more of how do we add value um, with our levels of autonomy. The most common ones you're probably familiar with is perception. That's what you see, that's what the machines see. You see that in your cameras, your LIDARs, your radars, your sensors, like all of that where your machine sees and be able to recognize um, different obstacles. And then you have the decision piece. That's your algorithms, your computing. That's what you're programming your machine, your software to do. And then you have control, which is more on the electronic side of things. Think of it like um, for all, all the boys out there, young ones, maybe girls too, that you have a car that you're playing with and you have the controller and you drive it around a go or so. Um, that's more of the electronic piece. And it also comes with your data visualization as well of like what data are you tracking, any warnings, any systems, monitoring the health of your tractor or your uh, machine in an area. So focusing on those three, those are the most common, um, the most common um, layers of where we're using autonomy and adding value. Marlena, can you tell the difference uh, between LIDAR and radar? I've heard both the words and uh, generally the radars are used in ships and the LIDARs are used in the cars about uh, to gauge uh, the other vehicles that are there on the road. Can you explain a little bit more about LIDAR and radar? When do we use a LIDAR? When do we use a radar? Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I'm still learning that myself, actually. But I think of a LIDAR is it's more of your light detection. 
and what you can see. When you think about your car, I think most cars today has a camera on the back of their car and it's sunlight, you can see it, and then it starts raining or your vision gets distorted and you can't really see anything. And so it's really having that, LIDAR for those who don't know, it stands for light detection and ranging. And it's a, it's a form of remote sensing method that uses light in a form of a pulse laser to measure ranges. So when you have LIDAR, it's really sensing your environment. It's sensing where you are, um, and it's all based on light. Your radar piece, I'm still learning more about that one in per se, my radars, but I know that it's all about what can you see, what can your vision, what can your machine um, sense in around to detect any obstacles in an area. Thank you. Okay. See, even I'm still learning on some cases. So common features are here where you can see a lot of these use cases that come up. This can be positioning. That's more of your navigation. Um, think of it like we're in agriculture and um, you have different roles that you want your tracker to go through in the line. Now, think of it that you have your data right to recognize that I want you to go down this role and collect crops or sort through crops. But the moment your light, not your light, or your machine just go off balance and just goes into a loop in a circle and have a field day, then something's wrong. So <laughs> positioning is definitely a feature um, from autonomy that offers you to go the course you want it to go and even to make turns when it comes to different objects. Um, path following is a subset of that as well, of uh, the path you want it to go. Um, in, in terms of crops, in terms of field, think of it as construction. When you're building concrete on a floor, um, you want it to go in a certain angle and not deter off that path. Um, you have your feature identification where you're identifying different areas, different objects, different materials, and then you have your sensor to be able to notify you on uh, what's in your environment. And then you have obstacle detection where it detects an object in front of you. There's different other common features like edge detect um, as well, wall detection, like very customizable of what you want that machine to do. Madlena, I have a few questions here. I've heard about uh, path planning and how we use reinforcement learning for path planning. So basically when the robot takes uh, the right path, we reward it, and when it takes the wrong path, we assign a penalty to it. And for the computation and algorithms that we saw, the decision-making computation and algorithms, for all these functions that we see here, the features that we see here, can you uh, tell us about some algorithms that are commonly used to code these features? Mm -hmm. Now that part, I cannot answer because <laughs> I am not on the programming side of things. All of I know is input, outputs, and parameters when it comes to that um, to that area. Um, okay. So yeah, I can tell you more about the software development piece and project management, but the coding and algorithm piece I can. That's okay. We are learning a lot from you here. Yes, so the good thing is as a project manager, um, who works with a team and even it's good to learn um, about your inputs parameters like understanding your limits and we have like our own like software environment where we're building on that and we're defining your requirements. Um, I can I do know from just working with my team that we have limits and rules that we put in place to make sure that the machine is doing what we want it to do and testing it unlike a mini version of a machine area. So let's go into it here. So let's talk about it back to high level, of understanding the state of autonomy and where, where it is today. So I'll talk about a few key players in the industry, including my own employer, on the primary markets, as I mentioned before, and the future outlook. So um, 
A wise man once said that the market for self-driving passenger vehicles would be over $80 billion um, by 2030. Uh, we believe the market for self-driving materials handling vehicles will be equally significant. Um, I think it's a no-brainer that the future is definitely autonomous, especially when you think of AI and you think about self-driving cars um, in an area. But you also think it the same for off-highway vehicles when you do more manufacturing, more supplies, um, more um, just robotics in general, and just taking it outside of off highway, like you have retail um, where you have robots as well. So it's a growing industry and you probably sense it from COVID uh, with a lot of merger and acquisitions and a lot of technology development. It is something that is rapidly approaching fast. And so that is good news for us because it, it gives us opportunities. So when we think about the players or who is all involved with this, we have four areas. You have your components area where they provide all your equipment. That's your, like your LIDARs, your sensors, um, your different mapping and GPS capabilities. So similar to like your car where you have a GPS navigation system to tell you where to go instead of how I was a few years back with my phone just driving trying to figure out where to go. A lot of more um, companies are um, importing or building their GPS systems within their um, cars and their tractors and their machines. So you have different players in the game, such as Tremble, who supply those different um, component pieces. Then you have something called Tier 1 Supplier, which is where our company stand, where we give um, our OEMs, which stands for Original Equipment Manufacturers, um, access to software, hardware, controllers, and even connectivity pieces um, to help build their um, autonomy, to help make their machines autonomous. We do not build the actual tractor or the machines, but we supply the software and the hardware needed to make it autonomous, if that makes sense. Um, for your OEMs and distribution who supply this, you have um, you have um, basically these are people who are our customers that we supply these materials for, and these are the um, the people who usually develop it um, for their own customers. So like using JBT um, in the aircraft in industry, you have your cargo, and so they build those cargo machines that usually take your um, cargo into the airplane. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few slides coming up. And then you have on um, your site level integrators. These are the companies that are actually using your autonomy vehicles, your um, components, your hardware, right there live on the site, be it in multiple markets such as construction, agriculture, even in mining. And a pretty well known player in that area is Caterpillar. I'm quite sure you guys probably seen a few tractors on the, on the road. Um, on the highway and even John Deere. Marlena, uh, so Emmanuel has a question. And before I move to that question, I had asked the question about algorithms. And uh, uh, Sudha is telling about the algorithms. I'll just read it out. Companies do not publish the exact algorithms they use, but it is standard regression models. Uh, Bayesian regression, neural network regression, decision for us for making decisions to start or stop the vehicle when an obstacle is identified in the road. The support vector machines with histograms of oriented gradients, HOG, and principal component analysis are the most common recognition algorithms used in ADAS. And uh, uh, thanks, Sudha, for telling us about the algorithms. And uh, I will move to Emmanuel's question here. Is off-road autonomy less regulated because it does not use public roads, typically used in private properties or restricted areas? He's talking about off-road autonomy. You have to repeat the question. Let me pull up the zone. Yes, yes. Is off-road autonomy less regulated because it does not use public roads? Typically, it is used in private properties or restricted areas. 
quite the opposite, actually. <laughs> we uh, we have a lot of regulations. We have standards, industry industry standards, uh, because it's off highway. We when you think about something as simple as construction, um, just construction and the safety at risk of workers who have a UC machine, there's a lot of liability and risk. And especially in our industry where we're the suppliers, there's a lot of regulation and policy and standards we have to follow because our end customers might take our functionality, our software, our hardware, and build up their own, um, their own autonomy um, pieces for their customers. And so, because we don't have control of how they're building it, we have to follow guidelines and best practices to make sure it's safe. Um, cars, well, cars, I'm not into that one as much, but I know with vehicles, there's a lot of liability in that one because that is your logistics and your workers there. And when you're talking about cargo for like the airplane industry, or you're talking about um, agriculture, where who, hopefully nobody runs over a dog, but a human being or even a baby in the field, you have to advocate for that. You have to support that. And so it's definitely industry um, standards heavy. Marlena, we have a comment here from Sudha telling we are eager to learn from Marlena about project management and software version in autonomous vehicles especially in off-highway vehicles with real customers. So we are all open to the learnings that you're giving us today. Absolutely. I mean, I will be happy to share that too in my few slides. <laughs> um, that's the good part. Um, that's the good part to um, software development. Um, so actually, let's talk about industries, right? So I talked about the different type of customers and where they fit in on that. So let's talk about um, a few areas and where those use cases could be. So you have a pretty well-known company called ClearPath um, Robotics. They're an industry leading um, company and they're known for mining. And so some use cases there is like path following, edge detection, area coverage, all of that using your tractors and that pieces. Then I talked a little bit about aircraft um, with the JPT um, company, where you might see use cases of positioning. Uh, when you look at the plane here, let's see if I can show my mouse. Uh, when you think about here, it's like you see a driver, you will consider that a what? Level three at this point, um, where you, they're controlling the cargo to make sure that they're loading up those contents into the plane. Um, but let's say we wanted to have it with little interference, it has to be able to recognize the plane, recognize the danger zones, and go to the right location to push forward. Um, all the cargo materials onto that plane and it recognized obstacles. There's a lot of obstacles on the, um, on the I think you call it the airways um, at the airport. So you have to be able to account for that. And agriculture, maybe because I'm hungry today, I don't know, I just love talking about agriculture. <laughs> um, same thing with road following. Um, you have lots of crops that you're growing. Um, in a road turns, like once you're done at the line, you have to do a loop there. Like once you hit the end of a row, you have to go turn around and get the next row. And you want to be able to have algorithms that do that on repeat and also with obstacle detection. Construction is very similar to mining in other places, but this is where we talk about path following, edge detect, area coverage coverage. And this is also where I probably wouldn't recommend fully full autonomy where driver is has to be there because you never know um, how every construction site is different. It's not a plain site. You're moving up and around across objects. Anything can come up. Who knows? And so construction, that's pretty important. So where where do we go to from here? Where is the outlook? So one thing I do know that as our autonomy um, technology advance, new transportation um, cases, uh, we know the cases are emerging a lot. More people are seeing the value in it. Um, it's becoming a bigger market. And so how do we know where the future is going um, with that? 
And it really depends on the use cases of today and tomorrow. Um, and you have to look at the players who's really making decisions. And so I like to go by four areas of what is being transported. When you look at today, like your passengers um, who's being transported in the air, what would that particular use case look like in the future? Or goods, right now you have drones with Amazon, you have driverless cars, um, like Uber, uh, like Uber, which is targeting in the future. And just recently with Tesla, even though it did went, um, I don't think they signed a contract yet with Hertz, they're looking to do car rentals. So look into what is happening in the transportation scene and what use cases are would give you an idea of what the future is headed. Then you can look at who, where can the vehicle operate because that's determine your automation. Um, who's driving, who's not driving, can we drive it? Do we need a controller? All of those type of view cases, who owns the vehicle? Is it a commercial vehicle? Is it passenger? Is there gonna be a future because gas prices are so high that really no one's gonna be driving a car in the future, even though I just refinanced mine. <laughs> um, but you have to think about that. And do they have access to it? Um, and what technology is being used today? What is accessible? What are we missing? Right now we have a chip shortage. What's gonna happen in the future when we one day don't have chips or what's the alternative? So I'm saying all this to say that the future, there's a lot of research that still needs to happen, but um, it's, in, it's um, inevitable of what can happen. So I did found some statistics online, did a little research here. Um, I found an article here and I can share the link by McKinsey and company of some projections that they um, think will could happen within the next 10 years or so. Um, they surveyed 75 executives who work in autonomy, uh, the automotive industry, transportation, and software companies. And they have a, a bit of an idea of what they think can happen. They think that we can reach a level four autonomy by year 2024, which is from passenger side of things. You can do your um, that parallel parking on the street in garages. Um, do your highlight your highway pilot, even though we're currently doing that right now with cruise control. Um, what's really interesting is that you have your robot taxes. That's your Ubers, your Lyfts. That's your um, your deliveries. And then you think about your trucks where you have a lot of commercialized logistics that are happening now. You see a lot of more companies are um, buying trucks on the highway. One thing to note is that we're still early in the game. It's a lot, it's a big technology, but we're still early on the technology adoption scale and it hasn't been really fully adopted mainstream yet. And so you wanna think about who even have access to these type of materials, not materials, to these type of vehicles. So with that said, one thing for sure, I do know that we're closer to the robot, the robotics taxi and the commercial trucking industry. And in fact, um, I used to work at Commons where they had um, a, um, an electric truck. There is a lot more um, commercial electric trucks on hitting the road. We already have different use cases going around with robot taxis. So robot taxes. So within the next year or two, you can really start to expect to expect more and more vehicles on the road. In fact, you already have some cars doing so. I think even with Domino's pizzas, that they have a few cars and pilot at the moment. And I think you hear stories about Amazon who are working with um, drones in an area. So I see it more of a commercial push versus a mainstream mass adoption, given the access and the cost of it. Let me move next. So what are the opportunities that it brings you? Uh, one thing for sure, if you have limited mass adoption for electric, um, electric in general, you do have re reduced um, CO2 emissions and a lot less traffic congestions. So who doesn't like the highway traffic jam at five o'clock in the afternoon? 
<laughs> right? So it really saves time in that one, any emissions that go out and it hurts our environment. Um, lower fuel consumption. I think last year, two years ago, there was a law that came into effect that by, I think, a year, about by probably like five or 10 years, that cars would not be, um, cars are not expected to be made for gas or fuel. So it has to go completely electric. And then you have reduced accidents. That's the main focus of these type of cars is to reduce accidents. But as I said before, it do have to come with an ethical consideration of what causes accidents. First of all, as a matter of fact, let me go to challenges. When you think about accidents, at this point, you're really transferring the risk from a driver to a machine. One algorithm can go wrong. One bad sensor could go wrong. And now you're in a life death situation of a car saying, should I wreck you first? Should I cause you to get into an accident versus running over a passenger or vice versa? These are life decisions that has to be made and have to be taken into consideration. And there are more and more regulations and policy that needs to happen. At the moment, you have technology that is accelerating faster than the government making decisions. And that is a concern. And naturally, because all of this is electricity, um, there are cybersecurity risks involved. And so are we protecting ourselves? I mean, who knows? I would hate for one day to be driving and find out my car decided that it wants to go pay for gas on itself or someone want to hack my car while I'm driving and cause me to crash. These are all valid concerns you have to think about, which is the fun part that comes into here is understanding your role as a technology leader in this place. So before I go into career pathways, are there any additional questions? Uh, yes, Marlena, we have one question from Sahita. Uh, Suhita is asking if you have any examples from the oil and gas industries about autonomous vehicles. I do not, since I am a software uh, development um, person. Okay, okay. Thank you. Absolutely. I like and the specific questions. <laughs> Yeah, we are all keen about understanding how we can career pivot to the space, what the opportunity space offers us. We are all yes for that. You kind of went out on me, so I didn't really hear the end of it, but yes. <laughs> so let's talk about uh, my background real quick here. So, um, as you said earlier, I am a software project manager. Um, I do wear the hat of a CEO and founder of an ed tech AI startup company. Um, I'm a local chapter president of Blacks in Technology. So if you are identified as a person of color of African descent, this is an organization I'm part of that really create that career pipeline. And I have started a very fun organization called the Minnesota Artificial Intelligence Network. Uh, which is for AI enthusiasts and to share ideas and enlighten each other about all the amazing work, challenges, and opportunities in the AI field in an area. So when we talk about my career journey, this is really a six-year journey um, since 2016 when I graduated with my bachelor's degree. I refuse to get my master's, don't plan on going back <laughs> anytime soon, but I really went the traditional route of graduating with internships um, in the supply chain manufacturing sp space and work myself up into project management. Um, after working in project management, you can see that I've been in different roles with different companies. It wasn't until I believe 2019 is when I truly started doing contracting and consulting, and that's what expanded my skill set in different industries. I worked and med tech, insurance, retail, um, all different areas, technology, um, but with the same project management background um, in that area. It is good to have a common um, skill set that can be applied to any industry. Um, around 2020, 2021 is when I sparked my interest in artificial intelligence. 
but I could not get a job in AI to save my life. So naturally, I had to create that opportunity for myself. And that's when I discovered Women in AI and who introduced me to a um, startup incubator program. I was able to sit on panels, get involved in AI conversations, and essentially establish myself as an expert in the industry and talk about AI, which landed me to my current job um, in autonomy vehicles, where we are a startup development team. And so I'm just one project manager um, who works for my team, but my team comes from all types of background. And so if you're thinking about pivoting to a career in tech, it's all types of careers. Most of my engineering team, software teams, they um, have our PhD graduates um, who do that R&D research, which I think is very um, important when you're developing these type of algorithms and um, algorithms and software, because you have to research, you have to find all types of use cases of what we're solving for and determine what is the best tool, what is the best mechanism, what's the best algorithm that we can use to solve for that, um, for that um, use case um, in this area. My background in all of my careers are in software development. So I come to my team and to the industry with the experience of structure and processes of how to build a software based on that initial research and customer um, background. And it's all to say that as the project manager, we have the technical responsibility that if we're going to build technology, you have to think about the people aspect of it, the, um, the data that you're feeding into it, the sustainability, all of those things that tend to get missed when you're just developing software because it's a cool thing to do. And I bring that balance to my team. So although I'm not as technical as some people would think, I'm just as important as someone who is building the software because I get to ask those questions, I get to challenge, I get to, be, I get to push back on certain um, developments and challenge the, the quote in there and say, are we building something sustainable? Is this something that's going to save lives? Is this something that's going to put someone's life at risk um, in an area? So software development, having that process, having the proper documentation, and even making sure that you're following industry standards and that you're mitigating all type of risk to make sure that the vehicle, the software that we put on vehicles on the road are safe and sustainable for um, our users today. So uh, that was a big presentation um, there. So I will leave it for six more minutes um, for any questions, because that is the last of my slide to be more of a Q&A to talk about my learnings and experiences. Uh, so uh, there was a bit of an internet problem and I wasn't there for a couple of minutes. Uh, Marlena, I, I think you can talk to us about uh, pivoting career and uh, we are eager to learn about that. We have another five minutes to close out. So we would like to uh, get a summary of whatever you taught us today so that we can carry it forward and apply it in our studies and learnings. Absolutely. Um... Given that you are here, which means you're here to learn, um, take from me is that just to get into this industry, I've been in my role since August of last year and learned a lot. And that's all about attending schools, networking, and being involved in the conversations, um, taking micro credential um, classes to learn about the technology and algorithms, and to network with key people in the industry. Um, I do have some links here. I might have a, a minute to show a quick video of what we do with autonomy to end it on a note. I do, but um, learn, learn from industry's experts. We do trainings on it as well, of real data of how we um, work with, um, how we work with our vehicles and software. But networking, getting boot camps, getting experience, um, creating that door of opportunity. Just because you cannot get a job now, focus on building that experience in that way. 
So I think I can share a quick video. Connectivity is really uh, the big topic for us in, in the digital uh, transformation and, and therefore it is so important and I, I think Davis here is a great example. We have our hydraulic platforms, we have electrical platforms, we have cloud-based control systems and so on and make all that uh, work together in, in a way that can really help our customers. That, that is in reality what is take. Bringing in new technology is what Danfoss has been about since uh, Mads Clausen uh, founded uh, Danfoss more than uh, more than 80 years ago. The key to this is, of course, that we do have the competences and that we are focused around these applications, which we are really good at and that we have the best in the world engineers doing that. I, I think that's uh, the foundation and, and I really think we have uh, that in place. We do see a really, uh, really uh, great potential for the future. So thanks for having me. I think I lost some people. <laughs> thank you so much, Marlena. This was a fantastic session. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me. It's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Let me share my LinkedIn. I will do that. Perfect. Oh, we are growing, which means that we are looking to expand our team. So definitely feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, check our website as well. We're always looking for talent, new, young, or old, or experienced, feel like that. So, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody watching on the live.